winter, the fourth winter in the trenches. The battles of yet another year had passed. Arras, the Nivelle Offensive, Messines, Malmaison, Passchendaele, Cambrai. Hopes of 1917 that had fallen and withered with the autumn leaves. The deadlock of the Western Front remained, but now it was becoming only a facade. Three and a half years of battle had crumbled away the living walls that had once solidly lined the front from Switzerland to the sea. The French army could only replace a third of its monthly losses. Its divisions were skeletons of only 6,000 men. The British army in France in January 1918 was 80,000 men below its strength. In every country, the generals pleaded with the politicians for men, more men and ever more men. Haig confided to his diary, We have plainly told the cabinet in writing that they may lose the war if the armies are not brought up to and kept at strength. In the place of the great armies vanished into gun smoke, there now stood thinned ranks of shaken survivors and recruits raw from the depots. Such was the Western Front of January 1918. In the East, there was no longer a front at all. In September 1917, the final defeats of the Russian army. In October, revolution and a communist government. In December, an armistice and peace talks. Hindenburg wrote, Under our last blows, the Colossus not only trembled, but split asunder and fell. After four titanic campaigns, the Eastern Front was silent. The peasant millions of the Russian army would march no longer as allies of the French and British. From now on, there was only one major front, the West. Russia's fall had transformed the war. Germany's problem of manpower was solved for the time being. Now the Allies, not Germany, were struggling against odds. Hindenburg rejoiced. For the first time in the whole war, the Germans would have the advantage of numbers on one of their fronts. We were now in a position to concentrate an immense force to overwhelm the enemy's lines at some point of the Western Front. Every German instinct was in favor of attack. Ludendorff wrote, The army came victoriously through 1917. But it had become apparent that to hold the Western Front purely by defensive action could no longer be counted on. Against the weight of enemy material, the troops no longer displayed their old stubbornness. They thought with horror of fresh defensive battles and longed for a war of movement. The German soldiers had fought the Russians at Tannenberg and Golitsa Tarnow. The French on the Marne and in Artois and Champagne and at Verdun. They had fought the British on the Somme and at Ypres. They had been skillful in attack and steadfast in defense. But four years of war had crumbled and shaken the German army. It was at last beginning to lose its discipline and its self-confidence. The words, Gott mit uns, God with us, 
were inscribed on the buckle of every German soldier's belt. Did he still believe it? Ludendorff wrote, Loss through desertion was uncommonly high. The number that got into neutral countries, like Holland, ran into tens of thousands, and a far greater number lived happily at home, tacitly tolerated by their fellow citizens and completely unmolested by the authorities. Only a great victory could halt the slow process of disintegration. In Ludendorff's words, in the West, the army pined for the offensive. Week by week, Allied intelligence officers verified the remorseless increase of German divisions in France and Belgium as the crowded trains rolled in from the east. It was estimated that by the spring of 1918, the Germans would be stronger than the French and British by 200,000 men. These were the statistics of catastrophe. In December 1917, the French commander-in-chief, General Pétain, calculated that in 1918, the Allies would face 200 German divisions in the West. Germany will be able to hold her line with 100 divisions. She will thus have another 100 available for a great spring offensive. We are on a tightrope. Only the Americans could fill the colossal gap in Allied ranks opened by Russia's collapse. In December 1917, there was only one American division in the line. It was hoped there would be 18 in seven months' time. Could the British and French, tired, thin on the ground, hold off a desperate German onslaught long enough for the Americans to tip the balance forever against Germany? Germans, too, asked this question. Only time, time that none could measure, stood between them and the United States Army. Hindenburg weighed the somber chances. We had a new enemy, economically the most powerful in the world, an enemy possessing everything required for hostile operations, reviving the hopes of all our foes and saving them from collapse while preparing mighty forces. It was the United States of America, and her advent was dangerously near. Would she appear in time to snatch the victor's laurels from our brows? That and that only was the decisive question. Time was Germany's enemy. Time was her enemy because of the Americans. Time was her enemy because her allies were on the verge of collapse. Time was her enemy because hunger and blockade and illness were doing their work behind the German armies. The pre-war death rate of German children under 15 doubled. Time was her enemy because German society was beginning to break up. On January the 24th, 1918, 250,000 workers came out on strike in Berlin and other towns. Time hounded her on to a colossal gamble. She must have swift victory or she was finished. She staked every last ounce of her power on a spring offensive in France. Every last ounce, every last hope. Hindenburg wrote, I hoped that with our first great victories, the public at home would rise above their sullen brooding, the apparent hopelessness of our struggle, an impossibility of ending the war otherwise than by submission. Ludendorff flung all his restless energy into planning the Kaiserschlacht, the imperial battle that would win the war. The blow would fall on the British astride the Somme on a front of 40 miles. The German advance would split the British from the French and sweep them into the sea. December, January, February, March, every man, every gun, Every lorry, every horse that could be spared flooded into France and Belgium. From generals to privates, the army was trained for breakthrough and pursuit. The objective of the first day must be at least the enemy's artillery. There must be no rigid adherence to the plans made beforehand. 
the fastest, not the slowest, must set the pace. Behind the front line divisions, 47 specially trained and equipped attack divisions and 6,000 guns were stealthily slotted into place. On March the 10th, Hindenburg issued the final order for Operation Michael. His Majesty commands the Michael attack will take place on March the 21st. Break into the first enemy position at 9.40 a.m. Haste, desperation, supreme effort. The German soldiers were infused with a sense of destiny. The brazen spirit of the attack the spirit of the Prussian infantry swept through the massed troops. One can only be amazed again and again at the preparations being made down to the last detail. That is, after all, the source of our greatness. The men were in good form. It was enough to hear them talk of the coming event as the Hindenburg Stakes in their dry Lower Saxon way, to know that they would fight as they always did, with an absolute reliability and without a word too many. The great attack will succeed. It must succeed. The breakthrough will free Germany from her hunger and suffering. It will bring us victory. So over the top and forward. This was the decisive battle, the final reckoning, the culminating attack. The atmosphere was extraordinary, heavy with tension and excitement. We are really conscious of the greatness of the hour. On the other side of no man's land, there was also desperate haste. The British and French trenches had been only jumping off lines for past offensives. Now, under the threat of the German onslaught, they had to be converted in a few weeks into deep defensive systems. Not enough men to dig trenches and lay out barbed wire. Not enough men to fill the defenses. Not enough time to rest the survivors of the battles of 1917. Not enough time to train the scanty reinforcements. The French and British looked towards Germany and wondered how long they would be given. In the trenches at night, when the wind was in the right direction, we could hear the German transport and trains rumbling up their great army from the east that was going to sweep us into the sea. We were grim. We were determined. Behind us lay the old Somme battlefields, every yard soaked with British blood. They were determined that they were tired, deadly tired. March the 5th, 1918. The battalion wants a rest. It had been up 42 days when last night it was relieved, and even now I doubt whether a rest is in sight, since an order has just come in to go up tomorrow for the day and dig. I leave you to imagine the state of the men's bodies and clothing after so long a time almost without a wash. The British had pieced together the German plan, a tremendous blow against the British army. They comforted themselves with the belief, if Germany attacks and fails, she will be ruined. The British Fifth Army, holding the longest and weakest sector in Haig's line, 12 infantry divisions to 42 miles, lay in the path of the German mass. Behind the 5th Army was Amiens, the rail centre that linked the British and the French. March the 20th, 1918. A cold evening, mist forming, apprehension prickling along the forward defences. Night fell. I couldn't sleep. A quietness I knew so well falls over fronts before an attack. The quietness was on. I fell into an uneasy sleep.
the stroke of 4.40 a.m., March the 21st, 1918, the German guns fired together all along the fronts of the British 5th and 3rd armies. 4,000 field guns, 2,600 heavy guns, 3,500 trench mortars, high explosive shell, shrapnel, mustard gas, phosgene gas. The bombardment had been orchestrated into a great symphony of destruction. It swept away guns, headquarters, telephone exchanges, trenches. The amount of firepower by the enemy was so great that those who aren't gassed or suffering from the effects of gas would be numbed by the shock of the continual bombardments. The bombardment was concentrated into only five hours. The German gunners worked with the speed of frenzy. It was like the end of the world. The gunners had their shirt sleeves rolled up. They are bathed in sweat. Never have they fired faster. In the forward area, the British waited for the hurricane to cease, waited for the German battle groups to loom up through the fog that covered the front. moment arrived and we rushed out of our trenches. A wild exultation seized us. Anger, drunkenness and bloodlust all rolled into one. We crossed the enemy's barbed wire without difficulty and were in his first line. The wave of men seemed to dance like a row of ghosts in the white whirling mist. The British in the forward area were outnumbered. They were swamped by the German advance. By the end of the day, the Germans had smashed gaps through the British defence into open country. British heavy artillery was dragged from long static positions in the rear and hauled away westwards. The British front trembled or crumbled beneath the weight and force of the German tidal wave. March the 22nd, disintegration and collapse. The Germans flooded through the British defense system all along the front of the 5th Army and on part of the front of the neighboring 3rd Army. Haig wrote in his diary, At 8 p.m., Goff telephoned. Parties of all arms of the enemy are through our reserve line. I concurred on his falling back and defending the line of the Somme. The impossible, the incredible had happened. The Western Front had been broken. As in 1914, a great army was treading the bitter road of retreat with an exultant pursuer at its heels. Haste, confusion, rumors, orders, counter orders, and always the menace of German fire close behind. A staff officer, one of our staff officers, rode up on his horse and said, Now, men, I want you to stand firm on this hillside. You've got a good position, and you should be all right. But the men didn't take any notice of him whatsoever. They began to stampede. And they said, We've no chance, sir. We've got no chance whatsoever. The Germans are coming up. They've got tanks. 
And he, so he started appealing to our regiments, and he said to me, I was at, his, at the side of the horse, he said, men of the East Lancashire Regiment, he said, no, you've got a very good reputation. Well, I thought, well, it's not much good here, is it, sir? And just at that moment, a German tank came up the hillside from the village, come up the hill, and started firing. Well, that started it. The staff officer on his horse got off his marks as quick as he could. March the 23rd, the retreat went on. Peron fell. Behind the slow procession of defeat, the sound of German guns came ever nearer. Along the road, a slow stream of traffic was moving towards Bapom and beyond. First waves of a tide which rolled westwards for days and days. Here and there a battery in column of route, walking wounded in twos and threes. An odd lorry or two, a staff car carrying with undignified speed the dignified sign of corps headquarters. A column of horse transport. I stood watching the unforgettable scene for 10 minutes. It was too sad for words. March the 24th, Bapom fell. A gap grew between the 3rd and 5th armies. The 5th army was now only a thin screen of stumbling, exhausted troops. The Allies faced disaster. That day, Haig met Pétain. Pétain told me that he had directed General Feal, in the event of the German advance being pressed still further, to fall back southwestwards to cover Paris. It was at once clear to me that the effect of this order must be to separate the British from the French and so allow the enemy to penetrate between the two armies. To the Kaiser, this was victory. He decorated Hindenburg with the Iron Cross with Golden Rays, last awarded to Prince Blücher after the Battle of Waterloo. The German press echoed the Kaiser's pride. The great battle in the West is won. A large part of the English army is beaten. But Hindenburg realized that the Germans were only halfway to victory. Whole sections of the English front had been utterly routed and were retiring, apparently out of hand, in the direction of Amiens. If the town fell into our hands, it was possible that the strategic and political interests of France and Britain might drift apart. So forward against Amiens. The Kaiserschlacht, the imperial battle, raged on. The line of gunfire crept ever nearer Amiens. Each side threw every man and gun into the struggle. The Allied air forces flew to the limits of endurance, machine gunning and bombing the advancing German troops. Only time to rebomb and refill tanks and guns when we land from a raid, then all machines off again on the next. Only the airmen could scan the whole panorama of battle. The country presents an extraordinary sight from above. Columns of dense smoke going up to 8,000 feet from nearly every town and cottage. Enormous fires from burning stores and dumps. Shells bursting every few yards. Columns of our troops retreating along all main roads and stragglers tramping westwards across the fields. Still the retreat went on. I think we were past hope or despair. We regarded all events with an indifference of weariness, knowing that with the dawn would come another attack. Once again, civilian refugees abandoned their homes and fled from the enemy. On the road, the flood of refugees was tramping along in the midst of a cloud of powdery dust that settled on every one of them. 
The air was filled with the squeaks of carriages, the smack of whips, and the jingle of cowbells. and Pétain strove to rebuild their shattered line. Hindenburg realized that the battle was becoming a race to Amiens. English reserves from the north, French troops drawn from the whole of central France were hastening to Amiens and its neighborhood. More reinforcements were on their way from England. Under my office window in the city, there passed this morning as fine a body of men as one could wish to see. They were a draft marching to the station en route to France. The wives and sweethearts of some marched with them. One couldn't watch these sturdy young fellows marching to face the terrors of war without a sense of inexpressible pride. March the 25th. To the men on the crowded roads, it seemed the retreat would never end. In the words of a gunner, we were on the move again with real dismay in our hearts. Officers were ordered to use their revolvers, if necessary, to check panics. March the 26th. Now the armies were fighting in the wasteland of the old Somme battlefield of 1916. March the 26th, we dropped into a trench. It was a trench we knew of old. We had started to retreat on the 21st of March, 1918. And here we were back in the trench we had started the attack from on November the 13th, 1916. In the shadow of catastrophe, the British High Command looked to the Channel ports. The French looked to Paris. A gulf was opening between the Allies. In Doulon, a drab little town in the path of the German attack, the Allied leaders gathered in an atmosphere of crisis. Haig believed that Pétain had lost his nerve. Pétain believed that the British would be herded into the Channel. Clemenceau, the French Prime Minister, was appalled at Pétain's pessimism. But General Foch was resolute. We must fight in front of Amiens. We must fight where we are now. As we have not been able to stop the Germans on the Somme, we must not now retire a single inch. This was Haig's chance to have the pessimistic Pétain overruled. He took it. If General Foch will consent to give me his advice, I will gladly follow it. The conference broke up. Foch had been made supreme Allied commander in all but name. But the crisis of the imperial battle had already passed. The tidal wave, the rolling force of March the 21st, had spent itself. Five days of marching and fighting without relief. Five days short of water, without proper sleep. Five days of the heaviest air attacks ever yet suffered by fighting troops. The German soldiers knew that the life and death of the fatherland were in their hands, but they could do no more. The power of attack was exhausted. Our spirit sank to zero. Day by day, the advance went slower, grew narrower. Hindenburg read the signs of failure. With us, Human nature was urgently voicing its claims. We had to take breath. The infantry needed rest and the artillery ammunition. It was lucky for us that we were able to live to a certain extent on the supplies of the beaten foe. Otherwise, we should not have been able to cross the Somme. 
British canteens and supply dumps had also served to hinder the German advance. The Germans had not seen such riches for years. We came across a richly furnished provision and kitting out depot which the British had abandoned. Joyously, we rushed for the provisions. There was the thick brown beer which we had done without so long and which cooled our parched throats. We were desperately in need of good food, so much in fact that we forgot about the enemy. Suddenly, they realized what paupers the Germans had become, how little the British had been injured by four years of war. You know that the German army and the German doctors didn't have any bandages? What we used were, was crap paper to wind round the wounds of the soldiers. And one can imagine how long that lasted. They just dissolved as quickly as many of the great coats our soldiers had to wear. The proud German army looted British depots like peasants in a palace. On March the 28th... Today, the advance of our infantry suddenly stopped near Albert. Nobody could understand why. Our airmen had reported no enemy between Albert and Amiens. I jumped into a car with orders to find out what was causing the stoppage. As soon as I got near Albert, I began to see strange sights. Men dressed up in comic disguise. Men with top hats on their heads. Men who could hardly walk. The advance was held up, and there was no means of getting it going again for hours that our troops did not achieve all the success that was possible was due above all to their not always being under the firm control of their officers. They had been checked by finding food depots and valuable time had thus been lost. The Germans grew weaker. The Allies grew stronger. Since March the 25th, a French army of seven divisions had entered the line and another was marching up fast. There was a whole fleet of trucks sent to carry off the entire division. There could no longer be any doubt we were about to go to battle. Our life was a constant turmoil for the next two days. We were going day and night, halting and then moving on again shortly after halting. Haig had drained the rest of the British front to bar the road to Amiens. By the end of March, the great retreat was over. We got to Ham eventually. There was the biggest town there was there, outside St. Quinton. When we got into there, nobody knew anybody. We, there's, there was no such thing as a battalion. You had a nondescript pile of all sorts of regiments, bits and pieces, uh, anybody at all. Sanity people, cooks, everybody. They were all in it. April the 5th. Disappointment in German hearts, weariness in German bodies. They strove for the last time to break through. They failed. The imperial battle was over. Hindenburg and Ludendorff gave orders for another offensive against the weakened British in Flanders, where the British line ran close to the sea and Haig dared not give ground. April the 9th, 1918. Three hours of bombardment, so terrible that it drove men out of their minds. Then the attack. Only half the number of men of March the 21st. Only half the width of front. But the German storm groups struck not British defenders, but raw Portuguese. They broke. Once again, the Allies trod the humiliating road of defeat. There seemed to be nothing to stop the Germans from reaching the sea. We reached a village called Estes. When we reached it, it was like the bank 
of England on a very busy morning, the Mansion House or Staines Bridge on a Sunday afternoon, or thousands, hundreds of vehicles and, and nothing moving at all. One of the drivers um, behind me was, in one of the wagons behind me, was crying because we expected to be taken prisoners. The Germans were coming on. You could almost feel their batteries leapfrogging forward. Haig had very few reserves. They had been sent to the Amiens front. One thing stood between him and catastrophe, the fighting spirit of the British soldier. Censorship reports on soldiers' letters home revealed the effect of the retreat on the morale of the army. No one ever believes we're winning. The Germans have gained more in a month than we've gained in one and a half years. There are a good many out here like myself, fed up, and don't care a damn which side wins. I'm surprised to hear you've joined the Women's Land Army. Do you realize, Maggie, you're helping to prolong the war? What does it matter whether we win or not? We shall never get it over so long as the women and girls keep relieving men for the army. Only when there are no men left will the war finish. That's the way the lads out here look at it. The men's nerves are gone, and not one man has any stomach for this game. In an order of the day, Haig appealed to the doggedness of the British soldier. There is no other course open to us but to fight it out. Every position must be held for the last man. There must be no retirement. With our backs to the wall and believing in the justice of our cause, each one of us must fight on to the end. The British fought it out. By the end of April, the Germans were again brought to a standstill. The greatest of all attempts since 1914 to win the war by purely military victory had failed. The very size of the imperial battle had doomed it. It could not be nourished, despite Ludendorff's ruthless mobilization of every horse and lorry and wagon. The German failure cost 350,000 out of their last reserves of men. Men were the fuel of war. As the manpower of Europe became exhausted, the war began to burn itself out, like a forest fire starved by its own appetite. Only America could pour fresh fuel into the diminishing flames. Since March the 21st, nearly 200,000 Americans had landed in France. Germany's chances of snatching victory dwindled with every tick of the clock. Ludendorff was forced to stake Germany's waning power on another gamble. With desperation in his heart, Ludendorff swung his armies south.